John Newton knew that uh, he was a wretch, he was a sinner. And yet it is through amazing grace that indeed John Newton also knew that he was forgiven and how he received that forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ and his merit alone. Paul has been speaking um, about justification by faith in the previous chapters and he's been laying out some of the blessings that uh, we have through justification by faith. And it is an astounding truth, isn't it, justification by faith? It really is. It's a truth that tells us that we can and are declared by none other than God to be just and right before him. To be declared as those who do not uh, face his judgment. But through faith alone, in Christ alone, in his sacrifice and in his death and in his resurrection, we have uh, so received God's grace and mercy through the atoning sacrifice of Christ that God is able to declare us justified before him. The one who knows all things is able to declare lost, dead sinners alive to him and cleansed and forgiven and right and just before him. And we just marvel, don't we? We marvel at the righteousness of Christ. We marvel at the grace of God in looking upon us individually and showing his love to us. And Paul has said it is not through any merit of our own that we indeed are declared justified. And it's not through any merit of our own even having been declared justified, that we have peace with God and we receive eternal life. It's all by his grace. It's all by God's undeserved favour towards us. But enabled by the price of his son. Enabled by the price and sacrifice of his son on our behalf that he might show us this mercy and grace and declare us thus justified because justice has been met through the dear Lord Jesus Christ's death on our behalf. And now you would think, wouldn't you, the, those in Romans um, and we would be humbled by such a truth that the pride that we often have would be crushed and that it would cause us to seek to live in harmony with God closer and closer and closer. And I pray it is. I pray, I hope it is. I, I pray it is in our lives. But it would seem as if Paul has picked up a disturbing line of thought that is going round after he has declared this amazing reality of justification by faith alone. A disturbing thought that has not disappeared. And I doubt it will ever disappear because we are sinful people throughout the world. But something we must tackle if it is showing itself in our life. And the thought is this. If we are saved, not by keeping the law or by our efforts, but by grace, through faith alone, why do I have to struggle every day to seek to live a holy life? Why do I have to battle with my scarred conscience over those things I should not have done? Why don't I just say, well, it's, I have God's grace so God's grace can smooth over all the rufflings. And I don't need to, to be so concerned about my daily living. And this is what it would seem as if some were tending to respond. If it's all by grace, then why bother with sanctification? Why bother with 
living a holy life uh, for God. And even more um, disturbing is the second part of that argument that, you know, Paul himself said in Romans 5.20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And if that's the case, then isn't it true that where God's people sin, grace overcomes and shows its power and mightiness even more because it overcomes and uh, stops from being undone that work of grace by God. And it's unbelievable, and I pray it is unbelievable, that people still think like that sometimes, but no, not in such a blatant way, perhaps. Some, some do. That somehow we can sweep sin and our wanderings merrily away and say, well, it was just that I wandered. And anyway, I'm not saved by works. I'm not saved by what I do. I'm saved by grace. And Paul says to them, this cannot be, this cannot be, this cannot be that you uh, think like this and allow sin to be diminished and allow the, the call to live a holy life to be diminished because of the grace of God. Now we might not think in such a crude way um, I doubt we, we think, well, I can do what I want because grace doesn't really calculate uh, my, uh, my uh, behaviour. It's, it's all based on God's undeserved favour, on Christ's death on the cross, and I'm covered by Christ's righteousness, and, and uh, what I do I cannot undo that if I'm truly his. I doubt we think like that, but I am sure... I'm sure of myself, and I probably am right with you, that sometimes we allow too far or too much leeway in our lives over the sin that troubles us. And although grace is a great comfort, because we're all sinners, and the depth of our sin is so great we haven't discovered how deep it is. But, you know, we astound ourselves sometimes by the things we can think and the ways that we go. We must never diminish that sin. And we must never treat grace as some sort of, sort of safety zone or buffer zone that we can, you know, feel sorry for a sin that was committed now and then just sort of forget it and think, well, we're saved by grace and now we can go and live our lives and do nothing about perhaps a pattern that has started to establish itself in our life. And it just shows, doesn't it, in Scripture, it shows how easy it is to twist an amazing, gracious truth and even, and even to allow it to be an excuse to allow ourselves to wander in ways that we should not. Well, Paul's very, very clear. If you understood this aright, there is no danger of that. But of course, we often think on our own wisdom. We often choose our own ways, don't we? And so Paul in verse 2 says, abhors this thought. He says, by no means the grace of God does not diminish the need for a life of ongoing sanctification. There is that work of God that is a one-off sanctification. Uh, we never work ourselves up to that. We will never be worthy of that. Uh, there must have been that act through Christ that, that set us aside, but there is that ongoing sanctification as a fruit of that great sanctification, as a work in this life. And it is muddied and it is spoilt in this world because, because we live in a sinful world and we're still prone to sin. But Paul says 
This is no reason just to accept it and to say, well, that's how it is, and grace will keep me safe. No, if we truly understand what grace is, it will surely humble us and cause us to long to live for God more closely, more dearly. Romans 6 says this, By no means, how can we who died to sin live in it? And it's, it's a, a wonderful verse, isn't it? By no means. Let this, this, this idea that grace allows us uh, an expansive, careless life, if you like, by no means let that exist. And then he says this, how can we who died to sin live in it? It's a factual statement, isn't it? As well as a... a, a statement to our consciences it's a factual statement we've died to sin how can we still live where we do not belong where we are not in in that sense how do we want to go back there now we all sin don't we we all live in a sinful world and whenever i um i uh, preach on aspects like this i I think to myself, I look back into the past week and I think, yeah, there's, there's areas where you needn't have said that, you needn't have done that. You should have said this, you should have done that. We're all imperfect. We have to interact with a world that's, that's sinful. Christ, when he uh, left his, was leaving his disciples, he prayed for them because they were going to be left in this world that was going to oppose them and would, by its nature, um, work against their, their new calling. And it is no answer, is it, to say, well, if that's the case, then we should withdraw from the world. We should um, not have anything to do with the world. We can see by the very history of the world, monasteries, converts, communes have never worked. Even Luther that was mentioned this morning, Luther... I mean, he was subjected himself to, to real agonies. He, he was alone in, much of the time in, in a monastery, and yet he was alone with himself. And that was the problem. No, we are sinners. And we do live in a sinful world. And we are far from perfect, and we do go astray. But let us not use grace as something to soften those areas and say, never mind. It's different if we repent from those things and come to the Lord and seek his mercy, pleading the blood of Christ. Because then, if it's true, there's a, there's a restoration that takes place. There's, there's, a, there's an application of the grace and mercy of God to us where he sees a genuine repentance. But where we allow it to become an excuse, where we allow it to become a just a safety zone that uh, stops us from dealing with sin in our lives and dealing with the carelessness, then we are to be far away from these ideas. How easy it is, isn't it, for greed to, to take hold of us Lust, selfishness, boastfulness, pride, all these things. Everyone, everyone has the potential and does fall to these things, maybe in different times of life, in different situations. And it's so easy just to go along with the world and say they're not really important. But as New Testament Christians, as New Covenant Christians, we cannot ignore the call of God in the New Testament, as well as the Old, but in the New Testament, to cast off everything that hinders us and to cast off any idea that we can sin cheaply. Romans 3 and from verse 12 is, is, is a powerful statement, but it says this, The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. 
Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarrelling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Well, as we read that, as, as you hear it, as I read it, it's a sermon first to ourselves, isn't it? So what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, first of all, we are to repent from our waywardness. The first sign of pride is to say, well, this doesn't apply to me because um, I'm living a pretty good life and I don't take this for granted. I, I don't treat grace like this. I'm okay. Well, perhaps it's time for you to repent. Perhaps it's time for me to repent. No, we're all prone to failings. We're all prone to carelessness. We're all prone to growing weary of doing that which would please God. So we're to repent from waywardness. Secondly, we're to remind ourselves of our new relationship with sin. We have died to its enslaving power, this passage says. It still has a great influence, but we're no longer in bondage to it. Once we were chained in the chains of sin, but those chains have been released. And though we are troubled by it, we are no longer in bondage to it in the sense that we're enslaved to sin. But there is more, isn't it? We have experienced a death and a resurrection. We have experienced a death and resurrection. You say, hang on, what do you mean? You know, I haven't died, I haven't rose from the dead. Oh, but you have if you're a Christian. You have experienced a spiritual death and a spiritual resurrection. You have died to that position that you were in of being at enmity with God. You have died from that position of being enslaved by sin. You are no longer enslaved to it. You are dead to it. It has no dominion over you. Just as a person who is chained in a prison cell all their life, the moment they die, those jailers may have uh, some control over the body, but their soul, their spirit has gone. They have, no, uh, they have no power over it. And so we have died with Christ and we have been raised with Christ. And now that is a spiritual reality in our relationship with Christ and where we stand to sin. And now we're alive to God's commands and recipients of his grace and power through the Holy Spirit. And so we're under a new master. And sin does not have that dominion it once had on us. And when God says, walk this way, it's not that we don't understand it anymore. It's not that we're unable to to obey that command anymore. We may not sometimes want to, and we are weak in ourselves, but by the grace and the beauty and strength of Christ, we can respond, and we can walk in this way because Christ has brought us from death to life. He has given us a new relationship with Christ. And as Christ was raised from the dead, freed so we have been raised from the death of sin. And so there's no question, is there, of New Testament Christians being careless Christians. There's no of being lawless Christians, of being indifferent Christians. No, grace does not excuse us uh, or, or cause us to say, well, we're, it's not like the Old Testament. We don't have to live by any standards. We... We, uh, we can live as we want. And if that's the case, it's probably just highlighting our ungrateful pride. 
No, we live for God under the law of love. We live for God because a new nature has been given to us. We obey his will because that is the way he has called us to walk. And what is amazing, he's given us a heart to do it. I know not always, but fundamentally, he's given us a heart to do it. Where once fundamentally our hearts were called to sin uh, through our enslavement, we've been released. And so it is a, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to, to, for which Paul does, he responds to this, this scandalous scandal against the amazing grace by saying, no, no. No. What grace does is enable us to serve God from our hearts and to obey him more closely. Not for our salvation, but because of our salvation. So how do we understand this? We're <clears throat> we know that we're not perfect. We are prone to wonder. Um, we do get distraction, distracted in life. We sometimes grow cold. And so what do we do as we, as we face life? Well, we have to fight the battle. Grace is not a free meal ticket, is it? In the sense that grace does not exempt us from the battlefront. And we have to fight. We're on the winning side. It's, it's by his power the victory is, is assured. But there is a battle to fight now. And so we must. And if we feel that we're being pulled aside to carelessness or to, to a sinful life, we must battle against it and we must nip it in the bud and we must deal with it. But nothing is achieved by just noting the negative, is it? The negative must be noted, but nothing is achieved by just noting the negative. Let's look at some of the actions and attitudes we're to have. We should have a clear notion of our new relationship with God in Christ. We are to be absolutely clear that our new relation, our new standing depends on Christ and Christ alone. Upon his death. And upon us dying spiritually in that death. And upon his resurrection and us being raised spiritually in that resurrection. The bond is that close. That is, we spiritually died to the power of sin in Christ's death, and we have been raised in spiritually to the power through his resurrection. Christ is not some sort of saviour who is far off in heaven. Yes, he is God-man in heaven. But Christ is with us. And one of the favourite phrases of Paul is, I'm one with Christ. And that just isn't a sort of, um, we're one with our brethren in Australia who are Christians. Uh, we uh, heard from one of uh, the attendees how um, a small meeting of Christians were surrounded by all these police. We're with them in that sense. But no, what it means to be one in Christ is it's a mysterious thing and yet it's a, an amazing thing. We are one with him. We're joined to him in the body of Christ. Our salvation depends on him. Our power comes from him. Our hope is him. And that is why the Holy Spirit can dwell within us. And so we're to have a clearer notion of our relationship with God. It's not a far-off relationship. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a servile relationship in that sense. Yes, we are his servants, perhaps even better, his slaves. Willingly. 
but Christ. And we are one. Not that we are become Christ, but we're joined in that reality. So how is this to affect us? How is this to affect us? Well, close relationships in, in our daily lives affect us, don't they? They say dogs become like their masters. They say, well, you know, other things about uh, husbands and wives. But if those things and close relationships so affect us, surely this relationship that we have with Christ, this bond in Christ, should have a very strong, and it does. Verse 11 says, Consider yourself dead to sin. You are no longer under its denom- uh, domineering power. And so we're asking ourselves, how should we respond to this call not to live carelessly, not to treat grace as an option to to live as we like? Well, we're to consider our relationship and what it is. We're to seek to be what we are, those no longer dominated by the power of sin. We're to refuse, verse 12, to allow sin to reign in our lives in our bodies don't let it dictate how you live and think you know some people um, they allow others to rule their lives and slowly but surely they cease to be themselves and who they really are and they just become a shadow and a follower But that is not what Christ wants us to be. Yes, this is the closest relationship that there can be, but he wants us to be what we are in Christ. He wants us to reflect him in our lives. So don't allow sin to reign in your body. Don't allow the world's principles just to eat you away and and before long it's dictating to you no Let Christ speak and let Christ be the one who shapes you. Do not present yourselves to sin, it says here. Don't present yourselves as an instrument of sin. It's interesting, the instrument, uh, if you, let's think of it as a musical instrument. Um, Some people try and play the violin, don't they? Some people play the violin. It's still a violin. It's not a perfect illustration, but it's just that unless we're close to our master, unless we're walking with him, there will be no sweet sound come from us. So we're not to present ourselves some sin. Do not allow yourself to be used of the evil one and to be used of our own sinful natures to be a channel of distraction to be a channel of bringing others into a place that they should not be and if we have any area of vulnerability a special vulnerability let us avoid it when they have forest fires I've I've got to be careful about forests, but when they have forest fires, they put fire breaks in, don't they? You and I need to put fire breaks into our lives. There needs to be those times as well when we come aside and we ask, well, what am I doing in my life? What do I allow and what do I accept that once I wouldn't have? And why do I allow? Is it right? Is it wrong? don't let us fool ourselves to be think we're strong enough just to just to go along without thinking upon these things for you cannot serve two masters at once one day your old master will surprise you you're not under his dominating power remember but we can so allow ourselves to go along that road that it seems as if we are Thanks be to God that the scriptures remind us that under any temptation, God provides a way of escape. And we thank God for that, don't we? It doesn't mean you won't be burnt, 
but it means you won't be devoured. Rather, and this is one of the important things, that we don't just say what we're not to do. Rather, let us present ourselves to God. Let us seek to serve our new master. When we were at school, I always used to remember lining up to play football, and I was always one of the last ones. Uh, I could play rugby, but uh, football was just a no-go area. And sometimes it was quite hurtful that they just didn't want you, they did, that you weren't good enough. And yet God doesn't treat his people like that. None of us are good enough. And he knows exactly what we are. And the most uneducated, the most untalented Christian can you be used powerfully for God. If we're but willing to seek to present ourselves as instruments of righteousness. Oh, wow. Righteousness is something that we so, I so, we so need in this life, don't we? And so let us present ourselves and not hold back, a bit like what Stuart was saying this morning. Let us present ourselves, be willing to serve God. People are rightly concerned about burnout. I know exactly what that is. But let's not fizzle out. Let us be busy for the Lord. Don't present yourself to fit sin, but rather present yourselves for God's service. And Christianity suddenly, the faith suddenly becomes more fulfilling, more interesting, more of a challenge. So, and do not present yourself to sin. How easy we, it is to walk on the fence, isn't it? What, you're walking on this wall and one side is the, the pleasures of the world and one side is the, the, the well, pleasures of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the service of the Lord. And it's so easy to say, yeah, I belong to that side. But all of the time, as you're walking along the wall, to be keeping an eye on that side and saying, oh, that, that, that's rather nice. It's, the problem with sin is it's, it's so often delicious, isn't it? It seems delicious. And it's so easy for us to slip off the wall and just discover a bit more about that way. And before long, we've, we, we've, we've lost our way. Rather, let us seek to serve our new master. Now, we don't rely on plans and programs, do we? And events and endless meetings to define what a busy church is. Let us not become idle in the things of Christ. Let us serve him. Otherwise, we will become an easier target for the evil one. And even the wonderful beauties of the gospel, even this wonderful teaching of grace can be twisted and used to take us away. If we're not serving Christ, using what he's given us as it was meant to be. And verse 14 reminds us, doesn't it, as we, as we briefly skim through these chapters which deserve a better look at, but go home and read them. Um, we're reminded that sin does not have dominion over you. And you may say, hang on a minute, I just felt I couldn't help it. Well, sometimes we, these these things are very, very strong in us. And often, because what James says, the temptation rises up from within. We've often nursed it all the way up. But he says something amazing here. And it's opposite. It's opposite than what so often these people who are claiming, where well, you're under grace, now you don't have to worry about uh, the law or worry about the commands of Christ he says for sin will know 
shall have no dominion over you since you're not under the law but under grace. And what does that mean? It means this. That once you were under the law, the foot of the law, and even if you wanted to resolve and reform yourself, you couldn't. The law told you how awful you were, but it crushed its heel down on you and, in, and you had no power to do anything. But now you're under grace. And when God says to you, walk this way, God enables you to walk that way because through grace, you're under grace. And through that new love that's put in within, within you, the threat to the law and the, 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 the um, inability for you to, to respond to it anyway, it's not that we become keepers of the law, but we can seek to begin to fulfill those great two commandments. To love God with all our hearts. And to love our neighbours as ourselves. And we could not do that when we were under the law. But now, because we're under grace, we have been given. That power and strength above and that constitution. To seek to begin to do that. And to seek to live for Christ. So next time you're troubled by sin... Ask yourself, have I allowed myself to be troubled by sin? Am I allowing it in my life? Because if you do, then it's a foregone conclusion that you'll fall to it again, that I'll fall to it again. But if you are battling with it, remember this. The devil may say it's a lost cause, but remember this, you're under grace. And that does not only mean that when you fall and when you see that you've fallen, and when you come to your knees to Christ, yes, it does mean that he will say, rise. Because your sin's been dealt with, your repentance is real. But it means this, that as that problem, that's, that temptation is presented to you in the future, you may call upon Christ and say, Lord, I know my weakness, give me the strength to resist it. And because your heart has been fundamentally changed, he shall often give you the strength to prevail. But it's a daily thing, isn't it? So let's be careful not to take the precious gospel of grace and use it to excuse sin or carelessness or, or a lawless way. But let us rather rejoice in the new relation it's brought us into. We're dead to sin, alive to Christ. And we're in Christ. We share in his blessings. We share his power. that resonates in his people. That we may find real fulfilment in living for him. Because he does not say to us, I just want you to live for me. But he gives us a new desire to live for him. And be ready to fight the battles. Grace does not exempt us from battles, does it? Actually, grace often puts us in the thick of the battle. But as scripture says, in all of the situations that face us, and tackling all of our sin, and we'll end with this, let us look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. And just remember this, by grace, through faith, you too are seated with him, not in that line of authority, but joined to him. And if you're so joined to him, you are also enabled by him. Yeah. So let us ask God to forgive us for our waywardness and seek to live for him. Not determined to tick the right boxes, but 
determined to love him more, desire him more, show him more gratitude, seek to begin to, to and continue to begin, to continue to carry on, shaping ourselves around this, I want to obey Christ because I love him. And that is the most important.